we're so glad that you're here. And today we have a special guest with us, Bob Raleigh, who's going to talk with us about some of the research he's been doing on what drives us to do what we do. So first of all, let me introduce my colleagues, uh, Mike Lawing from North Carolina. Hi, Mike, how are you doing? I'm doing good. It's good to be here with everybody today. Thank you. Nice, nice to meet you as well. Uh, Mike is a longtime survivor of kidney cancer. Quite a while, let's see. I think I'm looking at 23 years now, so <laughs> we're doing good. Good job, good job. <laughs> It's still active and I have a scan next week and it's just, you know, we're just here. We're enjoying life. Good for you. That's nice to hear. And welcome Robin. Uh, how are you doing? You're Hi Robin. Hi Mike. Hi Joyce. It's good to see both of you and it's nice to meet you. Robin is yeah. in Colorado and she's the lead moderator for smartpatients.com. Uh, which has discussion groups for many different uh, patient categories, uh, mostly around conditions or particular troublesome aspects of different conditions. Mm -hmm. Great. So uh, both of us talk with a lot of people with rare diseases, and um, mm -hmm. that's how we came to the, the show, The Powerful Patient, is uh, helping mm -hmm. people manage long-term, uh, lifetime, lifelong often conditions that they have to deal with. So, so mm. tell us about you and a little bit about how you came to do this research into why we do the things that we do. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, again, it's great to meet all, all of you. And, uh, and I was thrilled to hear I, I would be out on a, a uh, podcast dedicated to powerful patients. So that's that's a re real uh, interest of mine. And I'll get to that in a second. I was trained as a psychologist in Syracuse University. And, and interestingly enough, my work at that point was really trying to dif differentiate different types of treatment for people. We, we started and this is very early on in terms of prescriptive therapies, but we started to think not everybody responds to the same treatment in psychology the same way. And it really was, it was puzzling to me. And so we started to, to look at uh, who would benefit from things that were um, typical words oriented, talk therapy and who didn't. So we looked right down the middle and tried to figure out what was the, um, the defining characteristics. And we started to, to, to look at the way treatments were offered and, and the components of treatment. And we found a, a difference. And I'm gonna hold off on the difference because the, the answers are really has, has come full circle to the work I'm doing now. So um, when I left the, um, the field of psychology, I didn't leave, didn't leave the field, I left the applied version of psychology. And I started working in corporate uh, America, mostly in, in the areas of uh, research and communications. And that led, led me to a lot of different uh, fields uh, I w ended up in um, the media and entertainment fields and started looking at why do people like what they like? Why do they watch the shows that they like? How do they want to consume this me me media? And so in 2002, I left the entertainment media space, moved back to New York and full time tried to um, research those ideas of why do people do these things. And um, six years ago, I founded PathSite Predictive Science. And we were committed to figuring out what, a lot, what, a, what the, the, uh, the literature told us about why people do they do, why do they have, they have the opinions they have, and why do they follow the, the beliefs that they have. 
-hmm. And we've got a, a, a great set of uh, facts and tactics that everybody uh, b believed were all um, associated with that, that quest of why people do what they do. And I started to, to narrow our search to three areas, data science, neuroscience for our brains and behavioral science. And we found a couple of really breakthrough things that, you know, like the, 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 I'll always talk about those, those stars that are, you know, got, the, got their start late in life. Well, these things were being researched in moral de development and things like that all the way back into the 1960s. So this has come forward, this 45 year strand of research, and it has proffered from fMRI research for your brain and uh, data science so we can measure the differences between people and, and then behavioral science. And what we found was there's this group, this, this strand of research in moral development that says all the way back to the, uh, to the, the Stone Age, they could find these instincts that people um, responded to and, and they, they uh, render, rendered these instincts part of survival benefits. So for example, I'll give you a couple of examples. The, the, the instinct to care for children is something that is, is, is a biologic instinct within us all. Some people are really passionate about kids. Some, some are not quite so passionate. Well, guess what? The ones who did were passionate. They protected children. More children survived. The group got bigger. So they were better able to survive. Same with fairness is an instinct that we can have a lot of caring about fairness or not so much. The other ones are loyalty, authority, and purity. And these elements combine for, for instinctual patterns that we all have. So when I, when I look at that, it gave us a, a sense of, how do these instinctual patterns come together and they're present at birth? And then you could, you, as you come, come through your, your school age and, and, and up through adolescence, every experience you have inf is influenced by those instincts. And they also uh, edit, edit your instinctual identity. So it means that those, those um, experiences you had w went both ways. The, in instinct, the instincts affected them and you, it affected you and your outlook. So, so when you get out, sort of evolved I'm sorry, time, they, is... they evolved that way, exactly. And that's exactly the right uh, uh, term. So when you finish the adolescence, you're, you're, you're kind of, you, you, you end up with your personality, with the decision-making process that, that, that you believe and your values around these instincts and life itself. And so then you're, you're kind of on your way to, to crafting who you are and, 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 and what's important to you. So those things are the things that conspire lead us to the behaviors that we show every everybody on each front of our lives. So, so let me try one that's very common to a lot of people is just losing weight. It's a long-term journey. How, yep. do you, um, how do people decide whether or not they're ready to stick with it or uh, what kinds of things do we need to try to um, call forth in someone's psyche to get them to a point where they're ready to take that long journey and stick with it? That's a great, great question. So what we ended up doing is 
when, when we came up with these moral foundations of these instincts, we can start, start off by, by saying that there's kind of a bifurcation. So you can take any population and half of the population, more or less, you know, uh, um, are probably people who are motivated mostly by fairness and caring. The other ones are, are there, but the caring and fair and fairness are really the, the biggest ones. So if you see, if I start to tell you some of the characteristics about those people, I'm sure you could tell me people you know like this, the way they kind of think about life, it says, this is the care and fairness group. I think about life, my real focus is on how we treat people and how they're treated by, by our culture. We aspire to treat people as equals, both in terms of opportunity and in terms of fairness and how we live our lives. How you start your life should not place you in a hole as to how possible your life will turn out. So these, these folks are driven by empathy, careness, and sense of social justice. They love finding new ways to do things and bring in, bring in new ways to solve old problems. And diversity and equality are really strong things for this group. They also kind of like to uh, uh, rebel a little bit about conformity. So I'm sure you can think of people that are really like that. Well, we find that, that those folks approach their health and healthcare and losing weight, stopping addictions and something very different from the other group. So let me take a second and read you what, uh, what that group is like. The, that group approaches things with, when you appear on this earth, there are certain realities we must face. There's a natural order to life. There are leaders and there's followers and a right way to do things. If you play by the rules, things should work out for the best. So they do things the right way. They have got a real passion for traditions because that confirms that we're doing it the right way. Um, they're, the group is, is more important than any single person. And they have a kind of a muted sense of fairness not, and care. It's still there, but they're not as over the top from the, the other group who has really got, got that emotionality. So fairness to them is applied in, in a hierarchical structure of, of the leader has more, is entitled to more and than everybody else and those type of things. So I'm sure you can think of people like that. Now, when those people think about health, one thinks of it as, as the entitlement of their imagination. If they can think of it, they should be able to do it and they'd like to do things on their own. The other group tends to think of it as a systematic approach to, to, to living. Like, like to lay out their, 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 their um, objectives. They like to meet those objectives and they'd like to have uh, their re just rewards for doing the right thing. And it's the same thing for healthcare and diet. So one of these groups, which one, the, uh, the care and fairness group, they are perfect candidates for weight loss like um, Noom or those, some, some of those psychological um, traits that they take into account. And they do it in a, in a, in a way that, that takes into account people's feelings about it. On the other side, you might have somebody that was more likely to be successful using the, the old Weight Watchers ap approach, a systemic approach that allows you to meet your objectives publicly and in a way that, that, that will work to you, for you. So 
Remember I told you about the, the, the research when I was um, starting my doctorate was about word therapy versus systemic therapy. It's the same thing, only now we know it's from your instincts. I see. It's so from your instincts. One group wants you to lay out the rules, and if I follow the rules, everything should be fine. And the other, the other one says, yes, but how do you feel about it? Yeah, exactly. It boils down to that kind of a, an approach. And so when we get into chronic illness and we get into things like that, I believe in my heart that if you can identify which works for each person and talk to them and communicate with them in a way that's consistent with their underlying instincts, you'll have a much better likelihood of them being adhering to their protocols if you explain it in a way that is consistent with their instincts. And that's why I think we get a lot of hit and miss outcomes for some of these chronic diseases. Because, you know, the, 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 as, as you know, as a powerful patient, you've got a demand to be a part of the, part of the treatment. And you've got to demand that the doctors are, 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 are going to treat you in a way or discuss things in a way that's consistent now, we know with your instincts. And so it's one, one more way to have a, a personalized healthcare approach is demanding that you get communicated in a way that makes sense to you. Right, I just sort of modified that a little bit is that we know we can't demand it because doctors don't respond well to demands. Uh, so we do yeah. form partnerships with our doctors and, and become part of the conversation. Yeah, and so what we're doing, we, we're working in healthcare to do that on, on behalf of patients to be able to let doctors know that there's this difference between people who see the world in different ways and right. that they would be benefit. So we, we do that as a kind of work th that we're doing in healthcare. So let's talk a little bit about COVID because COVID also has been going on for a very long time. Uh, we're all getting yeah. tired of it. But on the other hand, we have to be smart about how we're going to get out of this year of isolation. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there are two aspects that we'd like to explore with you. One is behaviors around um, masks and social distancing, mm -hmm. how people are making their own choices about conformity or non-conformity to the recommendations mm -hmm. of the CDC and the World Health Organization. So what, what drives those choices and behaviors? Well, the thing about it is these, these uh, individual patterns that I de described to you, they're really candidly all encompassing. We talked a bit about whole person insights. These things are, are things that when we talk about healthcare, or managing your wealth, your relationships, the security or, or care for yourself, these things run through the entire gamut of how you think about the world. So these things, unfortunately have with the advent of social media have really evolved into kind of like tribal cultures and people tend not to welcome contrary points of view for their whole person insights so when when a person is in the tribe that values compassion and empathy and and fairness all of those people are predisposed to um, that instinct to, 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 to want to follow those rules. And so they will kind of instinctually say, I'll, I'm bas masking up. That's what I was told to do. And, it, and I definitely want to care for everyone else to do that. And this, uh, these other f folks that are in the, in the other tribe, they've made it kind of a, defined it as a duty, but people on their team tends, tend not to, to wanna be told what to do. 
And so those, those folks are saying, you can't tell me what to do, so I'm not going to voluntarily do that. And it's, so it is. It's very interesting to me that when, because I, uh, I was one of the early people who pitched in and made masks when you couldn't get them. And uh, yes. in, I put together, I think, three different programs on how to make masks at home. And when I was looking for some pictures of people in masks and looking for different ethnicities for my pictures, um, I came across a number of articles about the attitudes toward masks in Asia. And there, they actually in Japan call them courtesy masks because their intention is not to communicate whatever germs they have to someone else who may or may not be That's able exactly. to deal with them. So I thought that was really a, a remarkable shift in attitude between right. the, I don't need a mask, I'm tough, uh, that we see in the US versus I certainly wouldn't want to communicate any germs to a vulnerable person that you see in Asia. Yeah, exactly. And it's the, it's the rules of the game for these two tribes. And what happened, you know, I, I think evolutionary wise, we have always done this, but the social media has, has made it, uh, the context of that so much more perilous because um, that notion of people in these tribes that don't want to hear contrary points of view and and you know in the old days we, we used to have you know maybe a, a crazy neighbor neighbor and you might have seen them but you didn't see them every single day on social media and now social media has forewarned us that these other guys are out there and they've forearmed us to to, to do battle right out of the gate and it's, it, it becomes a, a membership right. You're in or you're out. And it, there, there's really no, um, no middle ground. So that to me is, is what we have to do is to work collaboratively with each other to try to break through these, these tribal cultures and get beyond the, the, those kinds of silly um, membership rights well <clears throat> i am very fascinated with this conversation because you know one of the one of the things about cancer treatments that we've started coming up with that has evolved is targeted individual therapy and so to see this in psychology and in counseling mm -hmm. that that they're doing that i i think that's incredible that uh you're figuring out how to possibly coach a doctor and train a doctor to maybe have five different sets of conversations uh, mm -hmm. you know that's that's on file that they can sit down and talk to a person that mm -hmm. that goes into these five distinct categories and get them to respond better and yeah. so are are you are you making any headway with the medical community and and breaking this idea to them? Well, we're we're just in the process of doing that, and and I think that what we will probably end up doing is making a a um, accommodation for the the med medical networks. So, candidly, I don't think we're going to get doctors to change the way they talk to patients, but we can have like, a, let's say uh, you, you spoke Ukrainian or something like that. They would have a, a, a translator into the, uh, the room with you and they could translate from the doctor to you. And I envision these kinds of conversations almost needing a translator. And so we can say to the doctor, tell us what, what the, the, the protocol is, and we can translate it into the words, images, and themes that will make the best impact on these, on these uh, patients. So that's how I think it's gonna work. Um, but we're, we're doing a lot of work trying to encourage the um, marginalized communities to 
get access to health care and and with the people yeah. who are um, anti-vaxxers, we're, tr we're trying to work with them at the same time. So. Um, I was wondering, uh, Bob, what do you think is fueling the anti-vax movement? Well, you know, the, there are two types that I, I think are, 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 are out there. So one is there's a legitimate group that really um, have a, a belief in the purity of, of people and they Many of these are, 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 are uh, affiliated with strong religious beliefs and they, they, they get their word about what is f fair and not fair to put it in people's bodies from a higher, higher, high, higher order, order person. And, you know, whether it's a Lord or it's, it's a, uh, a pastor or a rabbi or wh whoever it is, that has a lot of sway with these folks. And they are also also not likely to have a, a lot of belief in only doing it one way. So they can talk themselves into all sorts of, of uh, beliefs around why it's okay to resist this. And, you know, if, if, if I were working with them as somebody trying to talk to them about vaccinations, we have to allow them the power of doing it their way. And it's not, I would never uh, assume to dictate it to them, but I would certainly try to um, reason with them on the version of safety and not the, uh... and then there's a, a second group, and that's the ones who are situationally of anti-vaxxers, and those are the guys who are, are uh, that first, second group that I talked about, the ones live, live in, the side, in the side of authority and purity and loyalty, and they're not going to do anything to dis dissociate from their tribe. So that's situationally that's not a real strong belief in it. Most of those guys are, will come along uh, over time. Bob, one of the things that, uh, you know, I, I read an article in the New York Times the other day, and, and it pointed out that the black community especially is extremely, uh, you know, anti medical because they they have an aversion to the way they've been treated in healthcare for mm -hmm. years anyway and so how how can we begin to overcome that inherent uh distrust in mm -hmm. in that in that large community because that's that's one of the things that you know they they're at a disadvantage anyway, and there are so many things they could benefit from if they had a good trusting relationship with the medical yeah. community. A couple of things on that. One, um, our public's perception of that is a little, little bit overblown in that when you look at the rate of, of willingness to take it, a lot of white Trump supporters have resisted taking it because it's not part of their team. And actually that means that there's actually more willingness to take it in the black community than everybody thinks. So it is, it is coming along, but we've worked with a lot of uh, communities, marginalized communities. And what, what we have to do, and we've done this, Allegheny County in Pennsylvania, the health department hired us to help build a campaign for the marginalized communities in Allegheny County. And so one of the real keys is finding community-based organizations that have a trusted relationship with the community and talking to them about testing and the safety of the vaccine and the likes such that they, are, they become the, the conduit to the community since they already have those relationships. And we're finding that when we take the effort 
to get into the community and deal with the trusted community-based organizations, they can have remarkable effects on the community because they're not going to take, take it from me, but candidly, they've got a lot of reason to, to, to distrust the system. So, but this is the way we've broken it down, get to the community, have the community talk to each other and supply them in the ways that they demand that. And, and I'm very confident that they're going to come along well above some of the white communities and Latin communities. Right. We're having success with that in Boston. The um, leaders of the black churches, the barbershops yeah. and the hairdressing salons yeah. uh, in the black community have been very effective in making in inroads there. And as you say, the resistance in the black community is much more about access than it is yeah. about attitude at this point. Yeah, I agree. Well, thank you so much. This has been a very interesting conversation and uh, very uh, fascinating research that you've done into what motivates people. And I'm almost afraid of how it's going to be applied by various marketeers that they're going to try to <laughs> even more than they're already being. Yeah. Well, they're like doc doxers. They don't like to take advice either. <laughs> <laughs> So, well, it's been a pleasure for me to spend a half an hour with you and and hear your stories and know that I'm 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 in your corner and any time I can come back and talk about uh, invigorating the patient population, I'd be more than happy to do that. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Robin, and thank you, Mike, for being with us as well. And thank you to everybody who's listening in today. We hope that you will be well and be a powerful patient. Thank you. That's right. Bye -bye. Good luck with your uh, good, good good luck with your scan. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks, everybody. Good.